my name is Ryan Kurosaki, and um, I'm a I'm a full Japanese um, descent. I was born and raised in Hawaii. Um, went to left home. Went to college at the University of Nebraska on a baseball scholarship. I ended up uh, playing some semi-pro ball and things, and an opportunity to sign uh, a professional contract with the Cardinals and played within the organization for approximately seven years and, um, you know, retired. I, I injured myself um, back in, basically it was 1978 when I was playing winter ball in Mexico. It hurt my arm. And, um, you know, in those days, uh, injury was um, pretty much the end of your a career ending uh, injury so um you know took a different direction in life so um but continued to follow baseball um i ended up living here in arkansas um and uh, so here we are we were wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your family background and how you first got started playing baseball or you first like your first memory is associated with baseball well you know, when this project, when Dr. Kitamura uh, presented this idea of kind of tracing my roots of how, how I um, got to got to play baseball, I would um, I would blame my dad. Uh, my dad was, uh, um, you know, he was uh, second generation in Hawaii. Um, I had an older brother that uh, started when played baseball. He was three and a half years older than I was. My father was a coach for the team, and it prodded me, prompted me to get um, to play baseball. And you know, I tried other sports, but I, I finally remember I asked my dad why baseball and. In Hawaii, there was there were Japanese leagues that um, they were really popular within the Japanese community, and my my father kind of hinted to me that he said that the, the Japanese playing baseball in Hawaii because there's such a mix. Um, ethnic groups within the islands and mixed mixed races that the Japanese um, by by just their size their you know abilities baseball kind of fit you know um, basically he said you know we're we're we have we're smaller boned we're just we're just smaller as a group as a um, nationality and he said baseball you can play baseball and be good at baseball because you know it's about ability it's about quickness it's about those um intangibles that uh you know that gave you equal opportunity to compete against different different nationalities you know and as i never really thought much about it after that until I got older and I realized that, you know, there's a lot of truth to it because, you know, baseball has, has evolved to become more international, but there's, there's a really push for strength, for, for size. You're looking at players that are bigger, they're stronger. And, you know, it's, is increase the competitive the level of competition and i think that's what we're um, witnessing today you know um so you know it, it it started way back for me and you know all i all i tried to do was just be the best player i could be and that kind of the success came um I can't, I can't find it, I can't find it, but it just, I just, you know, had a lot of success. 
Um, you know, we won the state championship in high school. I think we were the first public school in the state of Hawaii to win a national a, a championship, state championship in baseball. Which, you know, looking back now, it, it um, you know, it wasn't really a a goal of ours. Our we just wanted to win. You know, we just tried. <laughs> it was just a complete competitive nature of kids, you know, and, uh, but that kind of springboarded me to, you know, go to Nebraska, compete at a higher level, um, and, and be successful. And it was always, you know, I didn't stand out as far as size, but I just kept, you know, I just kept winning. I, I've kind of thought about it and I just, uh, you know, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't explain why, I can't explain how, but all I, you know, I've thought about it and I've told people, I said, you know, all I wanted was get the batter out. <laughs> and as a pitcher, that's, that's success, you know, if you can get the batter out. And so that kind of was my, my direction. While you were playing in Hawaii, was there any player that you looked up to or idolized? Well, my dad used to, um, well, we would follow, I would follow my, my father and my brother and watch him play and compete at uh, different levels. And there was a league in Hawaii called the AJA, American Japanese Association League that comprised um, of Japanese um, descent. You know, you had to have Japanese blood to play in this league. And every Sunday, you know, for years, we would go to the games and watch the, the local talent compete against each other. There were other leagues that were mixed, were um, like we had a, a, a Puerto Rican league that had, you know, anybody could play in that league. And, you know, they were bigger, they were stronger, but, you know, it's just, you know, watching player, I mean, baseball players compete against each other, you know, it's just, it, you know, I found a lot of, I just, you know, really enjoyed watching it and watching the competitive nature, you know, strategies. And so, you know, it kind of just fed, fed my, my identity. And so, you know, I just uh, kind of um, just migrated right to following baseball. And we used to have a triple A team in the islands called the Hawaii Islanders. And my dad used to take us religiously every week, as long as they went to go and watch the Islanders play. And so, you, you know, you, you're getting infusion of this, of, of this higher level of um, play that kind of just made me strive to keep getting better and better. You know, it just, it's that competitive nature, I guess, to a lot of um, athletes today, you know the same drive, so. But anyway, unbeknownst to me, you know, this is not intentional. This is just, I guess, part of my personality. Were you uh, following uh, the major league games? You were watching them somehow, or were you following the news? Well, we did because I remember, you know, when we would use baseball equipments, there were always there was always a signature on the bats, you know, and we, our baseball gloves, all the equipment that we used came from the um, professional ranks. And so we would follow the Mickey Mantles, you know, we knew who they were and that was kind of fed into this, you know, this picture of baseball in Hawaii and every, you know, the other islands had other, had teams that we competed with um, and you know, even today, there's there's players at the um, professional level that that have come from the other islands because you know it just started growing. I think as um, you know, as just a sport, and it was something that everybody could embrace. Everybody could you know feel like they're a part of, and um, you know, it's just. I think it's just one of those that you don't really think about it when you're competing. You know, but I think that's what sport is. It's sports is, you know, competing against what's in front of you. 
and what's presented to you. So, for a long time, there are almost no Asian players uh, playing in the major leagues, and uh, with some exceptions like uh, Masanori Murakami. Um, I'm just wondering if you, you know, had heard about him, you had followed him. I mean, he played for the San Francisco Giants in '64 and '65, uh, and uh, uh, considered a pioneer in, in, you know, bringing Asia. Uh, sort of close to Major League Baseball? Well, I had um, followed Masanori Murakami um, a little bit because my dad used to take us fishing on Sunday. And during the Sunday games, they would um, broadcast the games in Hawaii. And my dad would always have a transistor radio listening to the game. And he, you know, he followed the football games and then he he followed the baseball games. So I was aware of Mar Murakami um, pitching for the Giants. I didn't follow him, you know, carefully that I, for his, during his career, but, you know, I knew who he was and, you know, I, and I, I think he lasted about two or three years and then he went back to Japan and, you know, um, so you know, I, I, it just something that, you know, I didn't, I didn't continue to follow, follow his career, but so everything was kind of geared towards baseball in the, in the U.S. Yeah. So you've told us a little bit about how you ended up at the University of Nebraska. I'm wondering if you can tell us kind of your journey to the major leagues and how you ended up kind of out of college deciding that you wanted to kind of go play in the MLB. Well, it's kind of a strange, um, it's a strange occurrence. I was, I was not recruited from the University of Nebraska. It's like, you know, nobody, I was never, um, it, it never occurred to me that the University of Nebraska was um, interested in me. And, and I was playing, after, after we won the, um, the high school championship, I was playing American Legion ball, and I also was playing for a semi-pro team called the Asahis, which were, was a Japanese team, you know, Japanese, local Japanese players. And we were competing against some of the military teams. They had Subpac, the Army, um, Hickam was the Air Force. And, you know, it's just a local league that um, we're competing in. And during the, while I was Playing American Legion ball, um, one of uh, what Dave Murakami, which was one of the um, at the time, he was really one of the um, more respected, better players in Hawaii at the time. He played third base, and you know we were playing on the same team, and you know it's like one, probably sometime in July, he asked me if what I thought about playing for the University of Nebraska, and that was probably as far, I mean, it was far from my mindset. I couldn't imagine where Nebraska was. I had no idea that whether they even had a baseball team. I know, I know they had a good football team, but, you know, the University of Nebraska was um, so far <laughs> out, of, out of my mindset. But, um, you know, he, he presented it to my parents and my parents were excited. And I thought, you know, it was just kind of out of the blue. This is, this is com coming from very few feelers for um, playing college ball to all of a sudden getting, an, getting approached to, to get a full scholarship to the University of Nebraska, which in today's world, that's unheard of. The, um, Tony Sharp um, offered me a full scholarship, sight unseen, and, you know, which if you were to even <laughs> present that to any reasonable person, they would say that is just, you know, unheard of. But I accepted it, and um, I, that summer I 
uh, finished the American Legion season. We ended up winning the state. We went up to Oregon to play in the regional. We got eliminated. So I flew back and within about two or three days, I'm on an airplane um, flying to Lincoln, Nebraska to play for the Cornhuskers. And, and the rest, I guess, is history. Because, <laughs> um, you know, I just, uh, I mean, it was really something that, um, it, it was, an, I, looking back, it was just kind of an incredible, there was an incredible window of time that all of this just kind of uh, occurred, you know, happened. And I found out that, I found out really probably within the last five years that unbeknownst to me, my high school coach, Herb Okamura, kind of mentioned to Dave Murakami that he felt like he needed to get me off the islands, is how he put it. And so Dave somehow got word that Tony Sharp in, Link, in uh, Nebraska was trying to build up the baseball program. And so that's where all the, um, that's where the whole picture starts, starts uh, formulating on, on how I got, I got to Lincoln. And I tell you this because ironically about five years ago, there was a reunion and, in Lincoln they have um, invited all former players to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska for a reunion. And I was able to connect with Tony Sharp, which was um, no Sam Sharp, Tony Sharp's son. And Tony had passed away, but I was, you know, I was standing next to uh, Sam and I said, Sam, how in the world did your dad recruit me out of Hawaii? Because I said, you know, I had never, never had any feelers. There was no connection to Nebraska. And he started explaining how things in Nebraska was unfolding. And so it was, it was timing. It was just, you know, probably the Lord's hand, I'm convinced, was behind everything. Because it's really, it's hard to fathom. <laughs> Were, were you always a pitcher? Uh, is that uh, always what you wanted to do? And uh, did you hit as well? And... Growing up, I played on the infield. I played shortstop. I played some third base. And in high school, I was sharing with my son the other day, you know, when I was a junior, I, I, um, I made the all-star team. But, you know, I wasn't, you know, nothing ever – came off of that, our team that was, we were rated to be number the, the best team in the, um, in the league, the ILH at the time, um, we didn't, we ended up not winning it. And so the following year, my senior year, um, Coach Okamura decided that I was more valuable just pitching. And so he said, he said, this year, this year, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, just have, you pitch and that way um we can have a set infield and so you know it kind of worked out really well and you know we ended up winning the state and so you know i i can't explain it i wasn't a part of it but everything our senior year just kind of fell in place and uh, you know we ended up being successful and from there, uh, you decided to uh, pursue professional ball. Yes, um, I went to uh, I went to Nebraska, and during the summer, I ended up playing for two years in a in a um, in the Jayhawk League, which is in Kansas, and I played in a um, a town called Liberal, Kansas. They have a um, they have a team that they. You know, it's a semi-pro team. They find you jobs in town and we play. They would um, invite teams to come in through Liberal and we would play them. And um, 
you know, I played there for two years. And, you know, this is just, this is kind of where, where it just, you talk about things falling in place. I ended up 24 and zero. I, I don't know. I was 13 and oh the first year and I was 11 and oh the second year. And I think it's this success is what propelled me to the next level because, you know, I've shared with people when you, when you get to that semi-pro and you're playing in these um, semi-pro leagues, you've got all the top college players that are um, competing. They're mixed in with semi former uh, professional players and, you know, just kind of playing at this higher level. And, um, you know, you end up going to uh, Wichita, Kansas, which is, um, has the National Baseball Congress um, uh, tournament at the, at the end of summer. And, you know, we never won it. We came in third the first year and second the following year. And, but since you're competing against some of the top college players, it gives, you know, all the scouts come into Wichita and they watch the, um, the play and, you know, I was offered um, a contract to play with, to sign with the Cardinals after my, I was three and oh, and I was no longer going to pitch. So they came and offered, you know, my parents were there and, you know, we kind of put our heads together and, and in during those periods of time, during that time, professional ball wanted players younger. They wanted these players to, um, because that gave them more years to try to groom them to the professional ranks, the style of play. And so, you know, they, I thought it was kind of an ultimatum. I was 21 years old and they told me that if I had, if I play another year of college ball, that because I'm, I'm, I'll be a year older. They can, since I was already considered on the borderline as far as, you know, whether I could compete at the professional level or not. Um, it was almost like, you know, this is a, a once in a lifetime and this, it, this is one chance you take it now, or you probably may, may not get another chance. So, you know, I, I, I talked to my parents about it and, um, you know, we decided that, you know, I could go back to school later and I signed a professional contract with the Cardinals in August and, you know, the following years, the following spring training, I, I went to spring training with the Cardinals in, um, in 75, no, 74, 74 was my first year. So that kind of started everything, uh, you know, started me playing started the ball rolling in professionals professional at the professional level so do you do you recall your feelings and emotions when you took the mound in the big leagues in the majors oh you know when i was i mean i think the first question i was asking myself was what in the world am i doing here I remember um, I had played one year in Modesto um, in the in the California League, and the second year I played in Little Rock, which which was a level double A. And I think I was successful there. I think what they told me was that since I hadn't give, I was I had the best um, stats within the organization. Because I hadn't given up an earned run in like a month and a half, I was I was in short relief, and um, I think within the organization people were struggling. There was a pitcher named John Denny that was um, you know one of the uh, high prospects, but he was struggling with St. Louis, and they wanted to send him back down to um, kind of get him, you know, work with him and kind of straighten him out. Well, I remember going to the ballpark and. Um, the general manager, Carl Swatsky, said, Kurosaki, you're going, here's a 
here's your ticket to St. Louis. You're going up to St. Louis. So, and, you know, there's, I mean, now going up to the big leagues now is so different from what it was then. You know, they just gave me a ticket. They said, uh, you know, you have a flight tomorrow. You'll be in St. Louis. They're playing the Dodgers. And, you know, just, just a matter of fact. And I remember um, taking the cab the following morning, taking the cab to uh, to the airport, flying to um, St. Louis, taking the cab into um, Bush Stadium. You know, you you got your equipment bag, you've got your um, suitcase of your, um, all your clothes. And you walk in and they just point you downstairs and you take the elevator downstairs and you walk into this clubhouse and you see all these names. And this is the part I think that was just, I was, why I was so much in shock. I didn't know anybody on that team. I had not gone to big league camp, which is where you really learn to mix with the, with the major league players. I was in minor league camp. And so I had no connection to anybody at the big league level. I mean, you've got people like Lou Brock, Bob Gibson, you know, some of these, these Hall of Famers, Ted Simmons, and I didn't know any of them really personally. So there's really, there's no connection to anybody. You know, I'm just kind of a, you know, somebody that just got brought up. And so I remember, Remember, they, I got my uniform, and um, we we had a day game. We're playing the uh, um, the Dodgers, and I was, you know, I, we go through batting practice. The game starts, and I throw a little in the bullpen just to get, just to show, I guess, the bullpen coach that I can actually throw a baseball. So I sit back down, and then as the game progresses. The Cardinals had a um, short reliever called Al Robosky, a mad Hungarian at the time. And he was one of the top uh, short relievers um, in baseball. And he started warming up. And I was just listening to him throw. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the world am I doing here? You know, I just, you know, you just see as, as, as players, you're always competing against other people. So when you're warming up and you're watching the guy next to you warm up, you know, you, you're kind of sizing him up too. And he's throwing a ball and the ball's just sizzling. And I'm going, I've never thrown a ball that sizzled. <laughs> you know, you, you're, you're, I'm making a comparison to, um, as to what I'm up against. And I mean, this is when the Dodgers had, you know, Garvey say they had, you know, really a good team. I mean, and Al Roboski just threw, he threw about 11 pitches and struck out three Dodgers in a day game. And I'm going, what in the world? You know, <laughs> this, this is crazy. It, it's just, the, um, you know, but you're seeing baseball at the highest level. And so, but here's the, th here's the thing, you know, I remember after the game, of course, I don't know anybody, you know, personally. And so, after we shower, we, we're about to make a West Coast trip. So they handed out meal money. And I remember leaving my equipment bag there. And I'm, I walk out of Bush Stadium probably a couple hours after the game. And I'm sit, I'm, I walk out on the um, sidewalk in front of a ticket office. And I'm looking around. And I'm going, now what? Where do I go? You know, I had no idea what I'm supposed to do now. Fortunately, one of the um, the third base coach was, which was uh, Vern Benson. He said he hollered at me and asked me, you know, if I had a place to, to stay. And I told him, Vern, I don't have a clue. I don't know. I don't know where to go. And I mean, it, this is just a contrast of today's game, where every everybody is cared for. You know, they they have they have. Um, People who, that's all they do. They're, they take care of the players, to make sure they have a place to stay. You know, and things then were just so different. And I remember just kind of, you know, not really having a, a clue of what, you know, what it was like to play at this level because it's so different from what, you know, 
from what I was I was familiar with, and uh, stayed at an old we stayed at a hotel that was close by, and um, you know the next day took a cab, went to the airport, met the met the team, and then we flew off to the West Coast. You know, so but it was just you know that type of mindset. I I just I was in another world and just really um, not prepared for where I was, what, you know, I don't know if that, you can, you can see what I'm trying to um, portray. So you mentioned like, uh, you know, the Hall of Famers, uh, uh, your, your teammates, I mean, did they have like camaraderie or was it fairly individualized? I mean, how would you describe the team kind of, you know, individual relations? Well, you know, um, I, f I found out, of course, I didn't know anything. I had never met any of them personally. And, I and, and um, you know, like Bob Gibson, as great a player as he was, you know, he was, he was a, you know, being a teammate is a lot different from being just an acquaintance. And so, he, you know, he, he embraced people. He had his own personality. He was, um, what a gifted athlete, you know? And, um, but I think I sensed that, that, you know, it was his last year. He ended up retiring after this year. So his career and all the things he had accomplished were, in, were past him now. And so, you know, there, there was a little bit of kind of like, you know, this is my last year type of mentality. And, but he was a, he was a competitor. I mean, and, you know, Lou Brock, he was a, you know, a, a real friendly guy. He was a good teammate, you know, but these guys were professionals. You know, when, when they took the field, they became ball players. And so, you know, that I think is what most people don't, um, they don't get to experience that part of the team team um, makeup, you know, when you become a team player. And, um, you know, I was, you know, very fortunate to just kind of be in, you know, as, as a teammate, not so much as a visitor, not as a spectator, but, you know, to, to brush shoulders with these guys. I mean, incredible um, group. About uh, a Ted Simmons, did he did he catch you? Was that? Uh... Yes, he did. He um, well, he was um, you know, he was a, the, the starting catcher for the Cardinals, and incredible hitter. I you know um, he he was really focused on the game, and um, you know, Hall of Famer. So, you know, he had all the tools and I think he he really kind of tried to um, pull the team together, you know, and, and you know, it's the, the saying is that the, the catcher has the whole whole game in front of him and he pretty much is kind of like the, um, in charge of, of the way things uh, flow through the team. So, I, I you know, you know, I've made the, I think I've made the comment, you know, that uh, I think one of the Cardinals' struggles this year was they lost their their catcher for years. Um, you know, Benji Molina, he's, he, um, he's not there. And all of a sudden, I think there's kind of a, a, a missing unit, a vital unit that's not aimed to embrace all these young pitchers coming in and kind of steering them, you know. And I, I think that maybe maybe have added a little bit to their struggles, but uh, you know, they'll work it out. Um, yeah, do you remember how the fans reacted when you first stepped on the mound? And then kind of after that, do you remember what the response was like from the Asian American community seeing you on the mound? I think as best I remember, I think I got the the best and the worst response when I was in LA. 
because LA has a large, you know, Asian um, following. And of course, you know, Masanori Murakami was the first Japanese. And I don't think, you know, Asians were not, <laughs> they had not been really a part of the game yet. And I don't know what they were thinking when I, when I was on the team. You know, when I went out there running around in the outfield and, you know, I remember uh, just some of the some of the very um, expressive comments that uh, that I heard. So, you know, but anyway, I never felt like anything. Things were directed at players and myself, but we never took, took them personally, you know, because we had grown up in that in that mindset. You know, when you're playing baseball and you're pitching in, in um, the bullpens and warming up in the bullpens of, of um, opposing teams, you know, you have the comments from, from everybody around there. And most of them are trying to, you know, upset you. And so it was pretty common, you know, but I think as a player, you just pretty much, you know, try to tune them out. And not that let them, um, you know, get the best of you. So, and I, I think I did that pretty well in when I was playing. I learned. I think I learned that from an early, early stage. You know, in high school and just kind of playing in all these different, um, these different le levels. College. You know, you you just learn to. That's just part of the game, and you just. If you're going to try to succeed, you have to be able to tune it out. And um, so I never took it anything personally. So anyway. How about reactions uh, in your hometown, like in Hawaii? Uh, was there, did you get, you know, did you feel the support uh, or was it just such a, geographically you know distant place that you were just focused on your game at the stadium do you have any reactions that you notice or remember well when i was playing ball when i when i first started playing pro ball um one of my classmates he was a year younger than me len sakata and uh lenny and i used to get together we work out together back home in hawaii and uh we would work, um, we're working closely with, with the University of Hawaii. Les Murakami was trying to, was built in the process of building the um, baseball program there. And so we would, you know, um, work out with them and we'd spend a lot of time at uh, Murakami Field. And, you know, we take batting practice. I would hit ground balls to Lenny and, you know, we just, um, spent a during the winter time winter um, season just playing some local ball with some uh, in some leagues and pretty much just kind of working out you know trying to figure out what we need to do how we can get stronger how we can improve our game and so that's kind of what we did and then about the last um Two or three years in my career, I ended up starting to play winter ball in Mexico. And um, uh, I went to a, a city in Hermosillo, which is in the Sonora Desert in uh, northern Mexico. And I played in the, um, the winter Mexican league. And so, you know, the, the, that's when I started, you know, I spent more time away from Hawaii than I did, you know, prior going back kind of recharged me about you know the being being from Hawaii but I think when I started spending more time trying to um, continue playing at a higher level um, during the winter leagues it uh, you know I kind of lost kind of disconnected a little bit there you talked a little bit about how after the majors um, to play in the league in Mexico. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what happened after you played in the majors uh, and, and your life after baseball? Well, after, um, you know, my career was very short. 
in, with the um, at the major league level. I spent most of my career at the at the double and triple A level, and so um, you know after I hurt my arm in next in uh, in the winter leagues, I had a sense that um, you know my career was kind of winding down because. In the old days, um, when I was playing, usually there were certain injuries that we considered um, career ending. And I, I've considered mine to be career ending. I had, you know, I, I couldn't, I didn't have the velocity that I had. And I was never a hard thrower, but I was, I had control, I had movement, and I had a, you know, I just throw a hard slider and things that, um, you know, pitches that, that that I could that I had developed to get people out, you know, and so I didn't come in and just rear back and let her and and try to blow people away. I just mine was more finesse. I just tried to um, you know stay away from the um, the barrel of the bat, so to speak. And uh, but after I lost, after I hurt my arm and I lost, I lost velocity. I, I realized that you know this this is what they call career ending. And so, you know, I uh, in, in 1980 I told the Cardinals that this was going to be my last year. And so, you know, um, I uh, so as the season was going, we ended up winning the, um, the Texas League and everything. And on the team, we had some older players like myself, and you know. A lot of us were just kind of deciding what we were going to do next, what was going to be the next, um, you know, step for us. And, um, you know, after the, after the year ended, um, in discussion with my wife and, um, you know, it was time we were, we were expecting to start our family. And so it was just, um, you know, I think in our in deciding to stay up here, I just felt like you know Hawaii was a was a great place to grow up. But things were starting to get really expensive, you know the cost of living and you know um, just I guess the economics part of it. Just I felt like you know that. We would have, we wouldn't have that the the pressure here that we would have had back home, and so we decided to stay here. And um, you know, I just uh, looking around to find uh, a new career. And at one point, I I thought, you know, maybe I'll get into civil service. And I had heard, you know, my friends back home talked about civil service and. You know, I, I ended up become a firefighter and in Little Rock. And, um, you know, I realized that I, I, I found some real, um, real purpose in what I was doing. You know, um, professional sports is a great, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you grow up with and, you know, it's, it's, but I re and I really, really felt like I put, you know, did gave it my best, my best efforts. And I achieved some success, but you know, the games are geared around um, personal success. And you know, you get your highs and your lows off the whether you win or lose and you know when you when you when you do something when you do when you find something that gives you more giving of yourself than um, receiving, I I really I found that uh, public service and the fire service really um, you know kind of made a fit for me, and so I I spent thirty two years on the, on the fire department here. In Little Rock, um, you know, you get exposed to just a whole different world, and um, you know, I uh, 
you know, giving, giving your best efforts, just not to your benefit. You know, helping other people rather than trying to achieve something that is so, well, you know, winning and losing, you know, they say you, you win, you're on top of a mouth, but the next day you have to prove yourself again. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the of the sport. And, uh, but um, I really found more purpose in what I was doing, what, what I ended up doing, so. Uh, we're kind of curious about what your thoughts are on the growing number of Asian and Asian American players in the MLB today. So I don't know if you've been, like how much you've been following, um, but just kind of some of the players that have been coming up. I I have given it. I I enjoy and I appreciate how the game has become very international. You know, they are what um, there was some there were some players when I used to go back home that ended up playing in Europe, and I didn't realize baseball had had migrated that way across the Atlantic. I knew the Pacific, you know, I knew Japan and some in Korea and, you know, some of these um, countries were embracing baseball, but I, I, you know, I knew how popular soccer was, I, I, you know, and I was really stunned to think that, you know, their, um, their professional baseball this professional baseball in Italy. And that was just kind of, but I, uh, I do follow the, the, the players from Japan and Korea and, and more and more, I think um, they are um, becoming a part of the bigger picture of baseball. You know, baseball is used to be, you know, um, pretty much, a white person's sport, and then and then Jackie Robinson broke the barrier, and then, then you know you have these athletes from different countries. You know the Caribbean, the Latin countries. I mean, they produce a lot of players that just you know baseball is. They're groomed for baseball. They can run. They can throw, and I was always impressed in in playing. While I was playing, some of my teammates and I was just I used to just step back and just watch just in amaze amazement of how really the game baseball really fit their um their build you know their their um, athleticism and being you know being a global sport so now you know I shared in St. Louis when I, when I was invited to throw a ball there you know, this past summer that this game is just, you know, it's now young kids in foreign countries are, are aspiring to be ball players because now they're exposed to it. And, they, and, you know, they, so I see the game, you know, becoming more global, being more international. The makeup of these teams will be, you know, not what, what it was, you know, in the past and i think we'll, it's something to embrace i think it's a way of people you know there's nothing nothing like being teammates you know just just with one goal winning and then celebrating you know nobody cares about what race you are you know everybody's everybody has had one goal and that was to win and when and in winning you can you can just celebrate and you know, so I think it's a great thing. I think it's um, the sport is it's a great sport to to um, to draw in that type of um, camaraderie and and just relationships with people. You know, the, the thing is, after the season, you know, we leave and go go our separate ways. That's the part that is hard as far as trying to maintain your relationships. But while while the season goes, you know, it, it's a good time to to just see players um, 
you know, rooting for each other, embracing each other. Were, were you so on, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Were you uh, keeping an eye and following uh, a player like Sotaguchi, uh, who, who played for the Cardinals, and uh, I guess Lars Nootbaar is another uh, player. Right. And, you know, that they're, um, I think Edmonds, the um, infielder, he's, uh, I think his mother's Korean, isn't she? And news bars, mother is Japanese. And, but you can see how they, um, you know, even in, in um, mixed marriages, how the players, the, 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 um, the players that come out of those marriages, how they they can just feel like they fit somewhere, you know? Baseball can provide that. And it's been doing that for, you know, for years now, but I think it's getting better. It's more and more, um, and I hope that, the, you know, the, 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 the fans embrace that too, that, that, you know, that when they root for their home team or whatever, you'll never, they'll always root for their home team, but you know, that it doesn't matter what they look like. It's all about, you know, work coming together and for a common goal, you know? And I think that's a, that's a good thing. I think that's what makes, makes our country unique. One more player I wanted to ask about, and this might be the last question, uh, uh, of this interview, and that's Shohei Otani. Have you been following his uh, story? You know, he's, you know, I think he is somebody that I know the 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 nation of the nation of uh, Japan just embraces. You know, he is. I mean, the guy is about six five. You know, and he's you know two hundred and twenty pounds. He is just kind of the just the vision of what a, an athlete looks like he is just you know he just fits that that mold and you know i wish him the best i you know but the tremendous pressure that is put upon him that to me is what you know i wish that some of it somehow could be he could be relieved of that to carry that much, to carry that much from one person, you know, how that would affect him, you know, internally. Because, uh, gosh, for one person to to carry the nation is, is that's a tremendous amount of pressure. And that's to me is what I I I see in what what goes on because everything he does is magnified. You know, and I feel like how unfair it is to to put that much pressure upon one person. But he is an incredible. He's taking everything with grace. He is, um, you know, maybe he's he's the person for our time to be able to handle it, and and um, you know he. And it shows a lot about, I think, the Japanese culture is that, you know, it's a culture that tries to, you know, you don't try to build yourself up. You let other people build, build you up. You know, I think that's what my, I remember my father was, has tried to really stress that to me that, you know, you don't talk about yourself. And, you know, I see that in him. I see that in the culture. So I think it makes him, I think for the, um, for all the baseball fans, it makes it easier for us to embrace him rather than to be, you know, very, very, um, just the flip of that. But he is somebody that at this point, it seems very worthy of, you know, of being, being really welcome into, um, to who we admire. Yeah, I mean, I have one kind of short follow-up. You've talked a little bit about how you didn't realize how international the game of baseball had become and how there's teams all over the world. 
I'm wondering if you had known that when your career was winding down, if you would have chosen to play kind of outside of the U.S. or if you would have still stuck with kind of staying and transitioning to a life that isn't revolving around baseball. I, you know, I don't know. I, um, I think maybe I got to the point in baseball that uh, of like of of continuing to play professionally that um, you know maybe it was time to to go in a d different direction. You know, baseball is we all know all sports is pretty much limited until you know there's certain sports like maybe golf or something that can be prolonged through you know um aging but um you know sports like baseball football you know basketball most of that is kind of geared to a certain age where you know everything's about production about performance and you know i had um i think i realized that you know maybe i i even had a sense that you know, the players that were coming on, being younger, being, you know, everything was moving at, at the direction it has. They're coming out, they're, they're stronger, they're bigger. You know, it's a game that I came into the game just before that became the, um, the norm. I mean, now, you know, you have players that are working out, they're getting stronger at a younger age so that when they that when they reach their 20 years old 25 they're at their peak and in the past when i was with the cardinals they they discouraged us from lifting weights because there was a different mindset and you know that that friend of mine len sakata he really opened a lot of people a lot of our eyes especially in Hawaii because when Len came back from college he had been lifting weights but you know there was a um, there was a movement about strengthening and doing lots of stretching so that it didn't tighten you up the the, the concept in baseball was that if the more you, the more muscle bound you are the more tight you you'll be restricted and you know, he disproved it, and and players after that um, disproved that you you can lift weights, and it does, and it makes you a better player because you're a stronger player. Not you're stronger, but now you can't move like like you need. You know, because there needs to be a lot of fluidity in in baseball, and so. You know, it's just kind of a, it evolved to where it is now because people have kind of, I'd say they forced the issue. You know, when more players are getting stronger and they're performing at a higher level, there's a direction that, you know, you have to join it or probably um, leave, you know? And um, so, and that's where we are now. I mean, these guys now are so strong and, you know, they're, you can just, visibly look at them and then you know that they're not <laughs> they're not the same players that that that, uh, that we had you know 30 years ago it's just kind of that's just been the direction of the game and so and i think it's with all sports you know so anyway um only time will tell but anyway i just um Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your, um, your interest in my life.